Yes, and good morning to everybody here, right here at Progressive Radio Network. This is Dr. Z, and listening to, of course, the Natural Nurse and Dr. Z program. And we're so glad that you could join us for this uh, fabulous radio. And you can always get more information by going to our website. That's uh, naturalnurse.com and, of course, drznaturally.com. And we, we deal with issues in health, wellness, and alternative medicine today. So we're going to be talking about some uh, – we have a great guest, Dr. Burns, here. And Dr. David Burns, and he's a graduate of Amherst College. I guess that's in Massachusetts, close to me here in Connecticut. And he got his MD from – Stanford University School of Medicine and completed his psychiatry residency at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. He served as acting chief of psychiatry at Presbyterian University of Pennsylvania Medical Center and a visiting scholar at Harvard Medical School. He's an adjunct, adjunct clinical professor emeritus of psychiatry and behavioral science at Stanford University School of Medicine where he was involved in research and teaching. He has so many awards, it's amazing. A.E. Bennett Award for Research in Brain Chemistry, which we could talk about today. Distinguished Contribution to Psychology through the Media Award, an Outstanding Contributions Award from the National Association of Cognitive Behavioral Therapists. And he's a teacher, like myself, a professor, and uh, he was nominated and, and named Teacher of the Year three times from the graduating residents. And that's important because we love teachers here because uh, they, they really, really know their stuff. If you can teach it, they say, then you really know it. Then. So Dr. Burns has, of course, written a number of popular books on mood and relationship problems with his first best-selling book, Feeling Good, The New Mood Therapy. And uh, now we're going to be talking about his book, Feeling Great. The Revolutionary New Treatment for Depression and Anxiety. So welcome, Dr. Burns. Nice to have you. Thank you. It's an honor to be on the show. Do I sound okay? Is the sound good enough? Perfect. Yeah, you okay. sound okay. great. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about um, psychiatry in general and then how you your approach to psychiatry tends to be a little bit different, I think. So Let's talk a little bit about, first of all, your book and uh, why you wrote these books. And then also, and then we'll get into some of your really interesting techniques, like keeping a mood log and uh, learning about cognitive distortions and disarming techniques and some of these really good tools that people can have. So as they say, they don't have to spend years and years in um, therapy which may or may not lead to their resolution of their problem. So again, thank you. And let's take off and uh, let us see here from your perspective. Right. Well, thank you for that uh, great introduction. It's an honor to be on your show. Uh, and I do have a lot of exciting new information to, to share. Uh, my background quickly is that when I graduated from Penn, uh, completed my residency uh, training as a psychiatrist, I did several years of research on this chemical imbalance theory of depression, that we have too little of the happy chemical serotonin in the brain, and that causes depression, and too much of it causes uh, mania. And uh, I, I was doing well with my, my research. I was winning awards for my work on, on brain chemistry. But the problem, I had two problems. One was that our research indicated that this theory probably was not a valid theory, that a chemical imbalance is not actually the cause of depression or, or any other psychiatric disorder for, for that matter. And in addition, I was treating hundreds of depressed patients with all kinds of antidepressants and we even had access to new antidepressants before they came out so we had Prozac in the mid-1970s mid it was called Lil Lily 11040 it was an experimental drug and I was handing these things out in large quantities to depressed patients and I rarely saw much from them and occasionally someone would get a bit better 
Uh, a lot of patients di didn't change at all. Uh, a lot of patients just seemed, seemed to get worse. We had a depression unit at the VA hospital in Philadelphia where we did research on depressed veterans. It was part of the medical school. And people on our unit, it seemed like they'd been there for months, some of them for, for years. And they never turned a corner on their depression. And I, I, I said, this, this sucks. This, uh, there, there's something wrong here. And I, I would go to these meetings at the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, there would be a symposium with a thousand psychiatrists attending and, and free gourmet food sponsored by some drug company given really amounted to almost an infomercial about their their latest antidepressant. And I had been involved in research on that drug and knew very well that it wasn't effective. And uh, I, I said, there, there, there's got to be a better way. And that's when I heard about this quirky approach developed by Aaron Beck at Penn, where I was, and Albert Ellis in New York. And they were claiming that an old theory going back nearly 2,000 years to the time of Epictetus was really explained not only depression, but anxiety and anger and guilt and shame and, and all of our negative emotions. And what Epictetus had said is people are disturbed not by things, you know, not by events, but by our views of them. It's, it's the way you think about things in the here and now. And if you're feeling depressed, your mind will be flooded with distorted negative thoughts, negative messages you're giving yourself, like, I'm not good enough, I'm a loser, I'm unlovable, I'll be depressed f forever. And, and that these messages aren't valid. They're based on what I called in my first book, Feeling Good, Cognitive Distortions, and I listed 10 of them, like all or nothing thinking, looking at things in black and white, if I'm not a complete success, I'm a total failure, or overgeneralization, uh, you know, here, here's a negative event, my, my boyfriend uh, of two years broke up with me, therefore I'm unlovable, and I'll be alone forever, that's what a young woman told me recently who was depressed following a breakup of her relationship, uh, or self-blame, blaming your, yourself for things, or should statements, I, I should be better than I am, I shouldn't be so screwed up. And the cool part of it, which I didn't believe at first, was the very moment you stop believing these distorted messages, your feelings will instantly change, because negative thoughts cause all depression, and all anxiety, and all guilt, and all shame, and the moment you stop believing those negative messages, the depression, the anxiety will disappear. And so I said, this sounds like so much BS to, to me. I, my patients are suicidal, they're severe. Some kind of power of positive thinking is not gonna help them. And so to prove it, just because I was doing research I, I, I decided to go to this weekly seminar that Dr. Beck was giving to kind of learn some of the techniques and try them with my patients and prove to myself that they would not work. And lo and behold, patients who I'd been stuck with suddenly started turning their corner on their depression saying, wow, this is really helping me. Can, do you know some more of these techniques? I said, well, wait another week. Each week I go to the seminar, I learn a new technique. and after a period of months, I got so excited that I decided to leave the university. I had a grant to, to have a brain chemistry uh, laboratory there at, at the medical school, and I didn't want to spend my life studying brain, things about brain chemistry that I knew very well were never going to help anybody. And, and so I, I, I stayed on as a voluntary faculty member and went into private practice so I could develop this new, what Beck called cognitive therapy, a cognition as a thought. And, uh, and then I wrote my book, Feeling Good, because I just wanted to share my excitement with people. And I thought patients and treatment would need a kind of manual to, 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 so they could read about things between sessions and the shrink wouldn't have to explain about distortions and stuff. And that you could use your time, you know, doing, indiv individualizing the, the, the treatment. 
And the book started out real slow. It was published in 1980. The publishers wouldn't uh, support it. They, they had made the decision that it had no commercial potential because they thought no one would care about a book on depression. It just sounds heavy and dull and uninteresting. But over time, it started selling because of word of mouth, because people uh, who read it, many of them, actually recovered just by reading the book. And a lot of research started coming out confirming this, that if you just hand a copy of my first book, Feeling Good, to someone who's severely depressed, and, and they, they read it, or part of it, over a four-week period, 65% uh, of them improved dramatically or recovered completely in that four weeks with no other treatment. And, and eight years after it was published. I finally got on a national TV show, uh, and I, I kind of had to do it on my own because the publisher wasn't really thinking, you know, to to tour me or so, or something like that. Uh, but I got on this Phil Donahue show, uh, and uh, that was nationally televised. And and halfway through the show, a woman in the audience raised her hand and said, "Oh, are you the person who wrote the book Feeling Good?" And I said, yeah, yeah, that's kind of what the show is about, to <laughs> make people aware of my book, because it's been uh, kind, of, kind of unknown for the past eight, eight years. And she said, well, I'll tell you that somebody uh, gave that book to my son. My son was suicidal, and he had decided to, to kill himself. And that book saved his life. And I think everyone in the United States should go out right after this show and buy a copy of the book feeling good and i couldn't believe my ears it was i felt so fortunate that that woman was in the audience and five minutes after the end of the show it was on the number one position on all of the bestseller lists except the new york times list it went to the number two position because it sold out so fast there weren't enough books to buy to get it to, to number one on that list but on all uh, on the dalton list it went to number one the publishers weekly list it went to number one and it sold more that day than it had in the previous eight eight years. So that that was kind of uh, kind of the the background on the thing. And then eventually we we left Philadelphia to return to the Stanford area, where I also joined the voluntary faculty about twenty years ago or so. And I, and then I have a, a psychotherapy training and development group every week at Stanford. And in the last 15 or 20 years, we've developed new techniques that I didn't have when I wrote Feeling Good that make ultra rapid recovery possible for the first time. And that's why I wrote my new book, Feeling Great. So therapists and, and general public alike who would like to use these new techniques as well as the ones in Feeling Good, the cognitive therapy techniques, which are still very powerful, to use them to change the way you, th you th think and feel. And so that's that's David Burns in a nutshell. Thank you so much. That's awesome. You know, the Buddha said you become what you think about all day long. So I'm curious as to why people get into this downward spiral of thinking and can't break out of it. It's almost like uh, a jukebox. Uh, I always use the analogy. I think I heard it on some program one day. It was like a jukebox, like the old records drop in and then you play that, the record, like, the, you know, the, the, the press record or the anxiety record or some other record like that. And then it's hard for people to kind of break out of this. So you're basically saying that some of these thinking is, has to do with bad habits. Not really, uh, no. although depression can become kind of like a, bra a bad habit because it's just a few circuits in your brain that control these negative messages, and and they 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 can get kind of kind of ingrained uh, in, into people, but uh, w it's been mysterious why this happens. You know, Freud pointed out, uh, you know, a hundred years ago that people who are depressed and anxious seem to be drawn to it and they, they seem to resist recovery sometimes and he, he called this therapeutic resistance and it was a great mystery to Freud and he spent his life trying to solve this problem and he never did solve it uh, and, and he never found effective techniques 
but we think we found the, the solution to therapeutic resistance as well as why people get sucked into d depression and anxiety. And the, the answer has been shocking in, in a really pleasant kind of way. You see, when I was trained as a psychiatrist and when psychologists are trained and almost all therapists are trained to view depression and anxiety as brain disorders, uh, you know, caused by a chemical imbalance in your brain or, or caused by a troubled childhood or, or a personality defect. And, and you can even buy the textbook of the American Psychiatric Association, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And whatever you have, let's say you're shy. A lot of people are shy or a lot of people have public speaking anxiety. And then you go there and you see this is a mental disorder, social anxiety disorder. And then you think, oh my gosh, I have a, a brain disease of some kind. Or if you worry a lot, then you, you learn you have generalized anxiety disorder. Or if you tend to be down and, and depressed, th then you, you, you might have dysthymic disorder, which means chronic depression, or major depressive, depressive disorder, which means two weeks or more of, of feeling really really down. And the problem with these formulations, it makes it sound like you're broken and, and, and defective in, in some way. So there's a lot of shame. And then you have to go to a therapist or a shrink who's going to fix you by giving you chemicals to fix this presumed but non-existent chemical imbalance in your brain or, or prolonged therapy to correct this personality defect or whatever. But what we've discovered is that depression and anxiety don't result from what's wrong with you. They result from what's what's right with you, from your, your core values. And what's most awesome about you as a human being. And in addition, we've seen that every kind of negative emotion creates powerful benefits and advantages for the person who's who's depressed or, or anxious or, or, or angry. And the odd thing is that when we make patients aware that their uh, suffering is the result of what's right with them, not what's wrong with them, it blows their minds and the resistance to change suddenly disappears and then we can help them attack these distorted thoughts like I, I'm no good or when I give my speech I'm going to blow it and everyone's going to look down on me and my mind will go blank and I'll make a fool of myself or wh whatever the negative thoughts might be and, and, and they can generally then crush these thoughts like I'm no good, I'll be depressed forever, I'm a hopeless case, I shouldn't be so screwed up. To, to crush those thoughts in as little as 10 or 15 minutes and not only does the depression and anxiety disappear, the patient typically goes into a state of euphoria. And now when I work with people, I can make that happen typically in a single therapy session. I work in two hour sessions and I generally just see people one time. It's, it's, I, I view treatment now as a procedure, not some, something you do once a week <clears throat> for years or decades, <clears throat> but to, to, to transform it quickly and then do relapse prevention training and then the person is generally, generally good to go. And so I think it's good news to, to listeners because a lot of people listening right now are depressed, some may be uh, suicidal, that you can change the way you feel quickly uh, sometimes without a shrink, just by picking up my first book, Feeling Good, or the new one, Feeling Great, and, and reading it and doing the, the fairly simple uh, written exercises, that you can change the way you feel. And I'm just absolutely thrilled to have these new techniques uh, available. So does, uh, does exercise play a role at all in, in uh, depression and things like that? How about uh, exercise and nutrition. I mean, I, I know, for instance, like myself, when my blood sugar is very low, I have weird, almost like distorted thoughts. And then when I, you know, have something, it, it kind of, the veil lifts. So I think the physiology plays of some role too. Of course, as a physician trained as a physician, both physicians, uh, you know, we, we respect the physiology too. So that, that that's an interesting uh, side uh, view on the whole thing as well. What's your views on that, doctor? Well, I think the causality is really in some, perhaps in the opposite direction. I did a lot of research uh, on 
nutritional supplements when I was doing brain research, like people thought L-tryptophan, you know, the precursor of serotonin would be the happy, the happy chemical. And I actually injected the largest, the largest quantities of L-tryptophan in history into the arms of depressed veterans. I, 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 I raised their brain serotonin levels to 50, 100 times normal. And it had no effect what, whatsoever on, on, on their moods. And, and so I think that the effects of exercise and nutrition are only mediated by changes in your thoughts. For example, I've, I've never had a runner's high. I'm just naturally happy. And uh, I, I ran up a hill 12 miles and I didn't get any runner's high out of it at all. All I got was feeling darn tired and had to hitchhike home. But uh, the, if you run and you tell yourself, wow, I'm really helping myself and I'm going to be happier and healthier, those thoughts will, will help your mood. I don't think it's a change in, in brain chemistry. There's this theory that somehow exercise boosts brain endorphins, and there's never been a shred of evidence for that. It's just something that someone made up, and we, don't, we can't even measure brain endorphins, much less find out if they play a role in mood. But it, the physiology works in the opposite direction because if, if, if you're very anxious, for example, I was treating a woman who had 10 years of failed therapy for severe panic attacks. Once a week, she'd start hyperventilating <laughs> and then hyperventilation gives you tingling skin. I'm feeling it right now from the little hyperventilation I just did. Mm -hmm. She would get a tight chest. She would tell herself, my gosh, I'm about to die. My windpipe is closing off. I can't breathe deeply enough. And those thoughts caused fantastic physical symptoms of pain and, and uh, you know, just intense anxiety. And, and, and it caused her to feel as terrified as a human being can be. You see, your thoughts create your, your physiology. And the moment you change your thoughts, the physiology will instantly and completely change. And what did it for her, uh, she actually recovered in less than six minutes. Uh, I, I induced with her permission a panic attack in the office. And I told her to hyperventilate, and, and I said, now imagine that you're about to have a heart attack. Your, your windpipe is closing off. And she started sobbing. She went into her severe panic attack. She was having five of these attacks every week. And she said, please, I can't go on. I'm, I'm, I'm about to die. I'm about to have a heart attack. And I said, if you were about to have a heart attack, could you stand up and do strenuous aerobic exercises? And she said, oh, no. She said, I know if I even stand up, I'm going to pass out. Well, as a physician, I know she can't possibly pass out. That's another one of those wrong, distorted messages because her heart is beating fast and her blood pressure is elevated. So you can't pass out under those conditions. So I said, stand up. Let's see what happens. So she stood up and nothing happened. I said, now start jogging in place. And and, and she started jogging very slowly and said, please, Dr. Burns, I can't do this. I'm, a, I, I'm about to die. I, I'm not breathing deeply enough. I'm not breathing right. My fingers are tingling. My fingers feel funny. Uh, and I said, well, jog faster then. So she started running, running faster. And after a minute or so, she said, oh, I can't go on. You know, I, I'm on the verge of death. And I said, well, do some jumping jacks then. And she said, oh, I couldn't possibly do jumping jacks. I said, well, do some jumping jacks anyway. So she started doing jumping jacks and 15 seconds into it, she said, I wonder if I could do this if I was having a heart attack. And then I said, is this what you see in the emergency rooms of hospitals? Patients on their, with massive heart attacks standing next to their gurneys doing jumping jacks. And at that point, she broke into laughter because she suddenly saw that her thought could not be true. And she went from the most intense anxiety and depression and believing she was about to die, she doubled over with laughter. She was laughing so hard. And then she stood up and I said, keep up the jumping jacks. I'm sure you'll pass out at every moment, at any moment. And then she doubled over again. And then she said, oh, I'm feeling a lot better. Her physical symptoms disappeared. Her depression and anxiety disappeared. And that ended 10 years of, of depression. She'd been treated by 
other people with, with drugs, with talk therapy, n nothing had helped. She'd been to endless emergency rooms and cardiologists. And that was 1988, and I've had to call her every uh, couple years because I have a video of that session, and I like to show it in workshops to mental health professionals. And I say, can I still keep showing it? And she said, I hope, I hope you show it to everyone in the United States because uh, I, I'm still on a high for, from that session. And that was, you know, six minutes that that changed her life. But your own thoughts will be different. The the, the idea is not that exercise helps because it doesn't. It has only a placebo effect, a non-specific effect. It's good to exercise. I exercise just for, just for my health. But, but it's crushing your own unique you, you negative, negative thoughts. And the, I have developed many techniques. That was just one technique that worked for Terry. I have developed over a hundred techniques to crush these thoughts. And the moment you stop believing these negative things that you're telling yourself and you see that they're not true, and that very moment, your feelings will change. Well, like say if somebody was driving and they had that, uh, the exercise is not really the therapy. The therapy yeah. is change, crushing the thought or uh, changing. Yeah changing the pattern i mean you kind of interrupted her pattern in a way that's a that's a right? great quest question she she asked me that question afterwards at the end you know after we did this uh, uh you know jumping jacks th thing i said and now this 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 technique will work for the rest of your life if you ever think you're on the verge of death do your jumping jacks and she said well what if i'm driving down the highway and and I get a panic attack. I said, you pull your car over by the side of the road and you get out and you do your jumping jacks. Now, like many anxious people, she had shame about her symptoms. She'd been hiding them from everyone because she thought people would think she was a loony if they found out she was having these weird panic attacks. And so she said, oh, Dr. Burns, I couldn't possibly do jumping jacks on the side of the road. People would think I was a loony. Word would get out. People would think I'm, I'm crazy or I'm a mental case or something like that. And so I said, so Terry, are you saying you couldn't make a fool of yourself in, in public? And she said, absolutely, doctor. I couldn't possibly do that. And so I just jumped up out of my chair on impulse, opened the door to my office, walked out into the waiting room, and started doing jumping jacks and saying things like, I'm a loony, I'm doing jumping jacks in my waiting room, I'm crazy. And she could see me doing this. She couldn't see most of the waiting room, but she could see that I was doing this. And then after a minute or so, I came in, closed the door, sat down, said, what do you think of that, Terry? She says, Dr. Burns, if you've got the courage to make a total ass of yourself in front of all of your patients, that gives me the courage to do what I've got to do between sessions to beat this thing. God bless you, Dr. Burns. Well, what she couldn't see was that the waiting room was entirely empty at the time. But uh, th th that was the, the end of her symptoms. She came in two weeks later. She looked entirely different. She was dressed differently. She'd been on a, a crash diet uh, and... Uh, and, and she was in a state of, of euphoria and, uh, and, and she's still feeling joy t today. And that's what I live for really is when I was a young man, when I finished my residency, I said, wouldn't it be great if you could, if there was a science of psychotherapy, because when I was a resident, all they told me to do was just tell your patients, say, tell me more and let them cry and get angry and get their feelings out. But that technique never helped anybody. And I always dreamed, I wonder if one could actually learn techniques and measure symptoms at the start and end of every therapy session and really learn how to transform the way people think and feel. And finally, that day has come. It's something I've been working on for, for 40 years to learn the techniques to, to, to do that. Uh, and for me, therapy used to be frustrating and disappointing because people almost never got better with the techniques I learned as a psychiatric resident. I had psychoanalysts supervising me. And now every time I work with someone, practically, 
practically. I see them going from sobbing and tears at the start of the session generally to joy and giggling and laughter at the end of the at the end of the session and it's just it's the greatest experience in the world for me. A lot of uh, mind body practitioners use called exposure therapy where you expose people to the particular uh, situation and, and I guess uh, you you help guide them through what happens and how they feel and things like that. But what you're saying is you're giving people tools to kind of help them in the moment of feeling that particular uh, sensation and whether it's depression, anxiety, uh, cognitive distortions. I love that word that you use. That's great. Or all or nothing thinking, um, self-blame, the should at, uh, should I or I or I or re, what do you call it? remorse questions? I guess I could have done this better or I could have done that better. Living in the past, so it seems like you're helping people live in the in the now in the present. Yeah, yeah. I can only help a person at one moment in, in your life. When I was a, a resident, it was all general therapy. Just tell me all your problems since childhood and all the things that are bothering you. And that process went on and on. Actually, not only does that not help, it, it causes uh, people to become worse because you keep firing up those brain circuits where the negative thoughts exist and the negative feelings exist. So you're practicing, you know, neurons that uh, fire together, wire together. In other words, the more complaining you do and the, and the more uh, thinking those negative thoughts and beating up on yourself, the brain just gets better and better at, at doing that. And so you mentioned a habit earlier in that sense, it is kind of a habit, but but it, it's always the same brain circuits, it's always the, the same p pattern. For, for Terry, the only thing that will ever upset her uh, in her life will be the same thing. I'm on the verge of death and and the jumping jacks will always work for, for her. That's all she needs to know. But for someone else, it's it's a different pattern, a different thing that they're they're telling themselves and a different technique will, will will cure them. And so when I do therapy, I focus the patient on I just want one moment when you were feeling upset. Uh, that you want help at, at that moment. And then I, I find out what, what was the upsetting event, what were they feeling at that moment, what, what were they telling themselves. And, and then we find the distortions in the thoughts. We, we show what the negative thoughts and feelings show about them that's beautiful and awesome. And then we crush the negative thoughts. And then they're done because that, that pattern, the thing they learn to do at that one moment will then work for them for the, for the rest of their life whenever, whenever they get upset. Um, and, and that's just the opposite of, of, of what I was trained in as a, as a shrink, as, as, a young, as a young psychiatrist. And I, I call this approach fractal psychotherapy. A fractal is a kind of a big word, a scientific word, but it's a simple meaning. It's a little pattern that repeats itself over and over again in nature, like trees make, la make leaves with fractals. If you look at a leaf with a high-powered microscope, you'll find that every tiny there's part of the leaf is made of the same pattern that's repeating itself over and over again. The, the whole leaf is contained in any tiny micros microscopic part. And, and that, that's the way trees make leaves. That's how, how, how uh, forests uh, are, are created through, through these tiny little patterns that keep creating themselves. And that's what depression and anxiety are. They're little fractals in the brain, a, a, a few select circuits that keep firing up over and over again in all different situations. And you might get upset in 10 or 20 or 50 different uh, uh, upsetting event, but the fractal will always be the same. And it might be, I'm not good enough, for example, or I shouldn't be so screwed up, or, or, or I'm, I'm a hopeless case, or I'm, I'm not worthwhile because I'm not successful enough. Uh, you know, we, we all have our, our own messages that, that we give ourselves that, that create our misery. But the good news is that you can figure out what 
message that you're giving yourself very easily with tools like the ones in Feeling Good and the new uh, Feeling Great book, that like the daily mood log where you, you write down your negative thoughts, identify the distortions in them, and then you use a variety of techniques to, to, to crush those thoughts. It's fairly simple, really, although for therapists to learn this new type of therapy that I've created that I call TEAM, stands for testing, empathy, assessment of resistance, and, and methods. It's hard for therapists to learn it because they're so ingrained into the patterns they've been trained in, the theories and, and methods that aren't really very effective. And one of the reasons I wrote Feeling Great is because patients uh, don't resist these new techniques. They want whatever is going to help them get better fast. And so, uh, and that's kind of why I wrote Feeling Good too, initially, way back in 1980, uh, because I felt people could pick up these tools and use them on their own, whether or not they're in therapy. And then research has confirmed that that, that is the case, that people can pick up these books and frequently recover from pretty severe mo mood problems. Yes, that, that's exactly it. Like when I was in Philadelphia, I, I created a large cognitive therapy program for our hospital. We had an inner city hospital where there was a lot of gang warfare and, and drug dealing and things like that. Our, our, our patients were very poor. And so it was essentially a, a free program that we created where people could come in and, and uh, we had a, a kind of a short-term residential facility and, and they got training in cognitive therapy six, eight, eight hours a day. And we, we had very severe patients, homeless people and people often who couldn't re read or write. And most of them recovered in three days from, you know, what was bugging them. But I remember once I created the program, I would go in and, and sit in on the, on the groups to see how, I, and I wrote a manual called 10 Days to Self-Esteem, which anyone can buy on Amazon, actually. It's just a 10-step program in very simple terms to, to learn to use these, these techniques. But this, this uh, one day, there was a woman in my group, and the, the, the nurses said, this woman's going to be in your group, and she's severely depressed, and she's calling herself a bad mother, uh, but we know her, and she's actually a, a beautiful, loving mother and a lovely person. And and so there were about 15 people. It, it was about a two-hour group, and uh, I asked if anyone wanted help, and, and she volunteered. And, and uh, I, I asked her what her, her negative thoughts were, and she was telling herself, I'm a failure as a mother. Uh, my, my children will, uh, will feel abandoned. Uh, I, this is my second episode of depression, and, and I shouldn't have let myself get depressed again. Uh, this shows I'm a weak person. Uh, th 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 things, things like that, pretty, pretty harsh messages, really. And again, I knew uh, from the nurses that her husband was taking care of the children, the family was, was fine, she was just beating up on herself. And people who are listening to the show probably are beating up on themselves too. And your specific messages will be different from hers, but it's the same pattern of I'm no good, I'm screwed up, it's my fault, I'm bad. And the technique, you know, I've developed nearly 150 techniques and what works for one person won't work for the next person. So you have to have a lot of messages because we're all kind of unique in our, our suffering. So you need a lot of techniques to, to mm -hmm show people how to change the way they think and feel. But the one that was effective for her was, was uh, the, the, the double standard uh, technique. And it's based on the idea that a lot of us have a double standard. Like when, when, when you're depressed, you probably beat up on yourself terribly, uh, saying all mean things like what she was saying to herself. But, but when, if you were to talk to another person who was just like you, who had the same problem, you you wouldn't tell them those things. And and so I, I brought her in the middle, put her in a chair and put a, an empty chair next to her. And I, I said, now imagine there's a woman just like you who's been hospitalized for depression. And, uh, and, and, and she's telling, and, and I want you to talk to her the way you're talking to yourself. Tell her your children feel abandoned. 
uh, you're a weak person be, because you're you're dep you're depressed. Uh, you're you're a failure as a, a, as a mother. J just say to her what what you're saying to to yourself. Go ahead, say it out loud. And then there was a long pause. I, there were about fifteen patients in the group in a circle, and everyone's wondering what she, what's she going to say. And then she finally looked up at me and says, "Dr. Burns, I, I, I couldn't say that those things to another woman." And I said, "Well, why not? After, you know, after all, you, you said, told me that those thoughts about yourself were 100 percent true, that you're a bad mother, that your children feel abandoned. It's important to be honest. Why, why won't you say those things to her? Because if they're true of you, they must be true of her, because she's just like you. And she said, well, Dr. Burns, that's ridiculous. Th th those thoughts aren't true. Wow. And I said, well, what would you say to her? I said, well, I would tell her that she's a very loving mother and that her children are being taken care of by, by her husband. And they, they, they feel fine. They miss her. They, they, they love her. But they don't feel abandoned. And she's not a bad mother. She's not a failure as a mother. She's a beautiful person. And, and she's doing the right thing to, to come into this uh, short-term program and get some help and get back to joy. And the idea that she's weak, weakness doesn't cause depression. Depres depression is a disorder that, that hits everyone. And, uh, and, and, and people with depression, I would tell her she deserves love and support, not, not abuse and criticism. And so you're, said, you're basically, you're, you're telling someone that was stuck in her negative thoughts to let go of that idea and uh, by, by pretending that, um, you know, she would say it to someone else, it, it sort of got her out of her shame and got her out of her, that funk that she was well, in, what, that what negative funk. Out. She still wasn't out, but then it yeah. got her out, as I said to her. Now, have you noticed how the way you talk to yourself is radically different from the way you talk to someone you love? Exactly. And, 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 and she said, yeah, you're, you're right. And I said, if you want self-love and joy, would you be willing to talk to yourself the same way you would talk to a dear friend who was just like you? And she says, do I have the right to do that? Mm. And I said, absolutely, you, you have mm -hmm. the right, and you can do it right at this moment. And she said, oh, this is blowing my mind, Dr. Burns. My depression just disappeared. And that, that's kind of how it happens. Recovery happens really fast. And that technique is called the double standard technique. And there's, mm. there's a lot of them in my new book, Feeling Great, and the original one, fe Feeling feeling Good. And again, it's just finding the technique that, that, that works yeah, I hear you. I mean, you know, as a trained naturopathic physician, we're all, I'm always looking for techniques that helps people with, you know, stick to their diet or stick to a particular type of life, particularly around the holidays. And that brings me to my question about, you know, with, with COVID going around and there's a lot of people that feel hopeless despair, anger against the pandemic and things like yeah. that. It's It's a making their careers or income go down. What are some uh, great tools that you could maybe share with someone, uh, some, some people that are facing yeah. these things? Well, the good news is, you know, it goes back to Epictetus 2,000 years ago. The pandemic is a, a terrible thing, and it's appropriate to feel some concern and to be intelligent and, and uh, sadness if, if you've had a friend who's become, become a, afflicted. But it's really our thoughts, not what's happening, that, that, that creates our, our moods. Now, I have on my website, feelinggood.com, tremendous free resources for people. And I do a weekly Feeling Good podcast. And, yeah, and, and we, we just had our three millionth download. And a lot of people who, who, who listen to them actually email me that they, they've recovered from... I, I've I've had uh, Corona casts where, where I treat people live on the podcast who ha are upset about the pandemic or something related to, to the pandemic, and and show once again how it's your thoughts, not the pandemic that that's that's causing. If you have severe anxiety and and depression and hopelessness and anger, that's that that's becoming incapacitating. You can. And if you want to recover, you can change the way you feel, even during the pandemic. Like one young man 
uh, w was severely depressed. And, and what would happen to him is he, he, he said his life had gone really well. He'd had a bad spell in his life and suddenly it turned around and everything started turning to roses for, for him. His, his, his career prospered. He got married. He got a house. Everything was going great. And, 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 and so he said he'd be happy but all of a sudden be getting hit by lightning and he'd have the thought, I don't have the right to be happy because people all over the world are dying in, in this pandemic. And then he'd feel hopeless and angry, angry and ashamed. And again, it's that thought, not the pandemic itself, that was the cause of his angst, his depression. He called it an existential uh, depression. But again, yeah. the moment he changed the way he was thinking, his negative feelings disappeared completely. And, and what was partially helpful to him is, is, is to see that he was essentially blaming himself. You know, it's my, as if it's his fault that people all over the world are dying. Right. And, and then once he saw the, the kind of, not only the cruelty, but the illogic on telling himself, I don't have the right to be happy because people all over the world are dying. Suddenly his depression d disappeared, but he still felt sad. He had a right to be sad. His mother had died and, mm -hmm. and he hadn't uh, really allowed himself to grieve for her. And he remembered that his brother had died when he was 11 and he'd never really grieved f for him. And so he allowed himself to cry and, and grieve for, for the first time. And that was also something that was very helpful and, and healing for him. On your website, you, you recommended a daily mood log. What, what would, how would that help people? Would that kind of have them write down in black and white how they're thinking so they can somehow see it from a different perspective? Yeah, and that's that's so that's so crucial, that uh, and that was one of the first things way back at the earliest uh, birth of cognitive therapy in the late 1970s. What I wrote about a lot in my book, first book, Feeling Good, and also in Feeling Great, is is you've got to write your thoughts down on a piece of paper when you're upset. And the daily mood log is a, just a systematic way of doing it, makes it kind of easy and, and well organized. But you see what those the, those negative messages are. And if you try to do it in your head, it won't work because mm. one negative thought leads to another. I'm worthless. I'm no good. I'm hopeless. The tr I see the truth about myself. I'm, I'm really a, a, a bad person. But once you write those thoughts down on a piece of paper and then on the back of the daily mood log, you can see the, the 10 cognitive distortions or thinking errors and their defi definitions like all or nothing thinking, overgeneralization, mental filtering, discounting the positive, fortune telling, mind reading, magnification, should, you know, self-blame, all, all the ones that you were mentioning as well. Emotional reasoning, I feel like a loser, so I must be one. And you spot those distortions, and then you can talk back to the thoughts and crush the, the thoughts because you see they're not true. Like, but you don't see it until you write it down on, on a piece of paper, and that's what the daily mood log is. You can even find one uh, and download it on my website, feelinggood.com. Right. But, but, you know, I think you have to practice what you preach as a therapist. And if you haven't done your own work, then maybe you're, you're not that great a therapist. But I remember when I was a resident, I was criticized by my supervisor for how I had handled a patient who hadn't paid his bill. And uh, I, I panicked. And on the way home, I was very depressed. And, and I was telling myself, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a terrible human being. They'll probably take my medical license away. I have no future as, as a shrink. You know, <laughs> just thoughts like that. And I told myself, well, David, why don't you write them down? That's what you tell your patients to do. And I said, oh, no, my thoughts are valid. That wouldn't do any, any good. And that's the way people think. You know, they can't believe that their thoughts are upsetting them and that the thoughts are distorted. And that's what I thought. I thought, no, I really am a bad person. I just don't know why it took me so many years of my life before I suddenly realized that. And then I got home and, and I told myself, well, David, write those thoughts down on a piece of paper. And I said, no, they're, they're valid. I, I need to boost my brain endorphins. 
So I went out on a really strenuous uh, six-mile run and I, uh, up steep hills, and I ran fast. And the farther I ran, the worse I felt. There was no runner's high. I was just totally convinced I was worthless and hopeless and that my career was over. And I know it probably sounds ridiculous to people listening to the, to the show, but that's what I thought. And that's the way you think when you're down or anxious. So I finally said, I got home, I said, write the damn thoughts on a piece of paper and see if there's any distortions. And I wrote back, I'm down, I'm a terrible human being. I shouldn't have screwed up with that patient. I'm going to lose my medical license. I have no career in psychiatry. I have no aptitude for psychotherapy. And I looked at the thoughts, and I said, my gosh, those thoughts are incredibly distorted. It's black and white thinking. Right. Like, uh, I'm, I'm either a total success or total failure. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I made a, one mistake with this patient, so I'm a total loser. Life is, is ruined. Yeah. Uh, Discounting the positive, ignoring the fact that I'd helped m many people, on and on. And then I said, well, what could you tell yourself instead? I, I said, well, why don't I tell myself I'm a beginner. I have the right to make mistakes. And I can talk it over with this patient when I see him tomorrow. And maybe it will even lead to an improvement in our relationship. And that's how I grow, by making mistakes, acknowledging the mistakes, and changing my approach. And maybe when I'm an old man... 78 years old on a radio show like this wonderful show, I'll still be making mistakes and learning from them. And, and that's okay. And when I wrote that down, my depression just vanished. And I said, man, this stuff really does work. I can't believe it. The next day I saw that patient and I said, you know, I've been feeling so down and ashamed because I think I hurt you last session, pushing about the bill and, uh, and, and I, my supervisor criticized me, and I think I had my priorities all wrong. The, the important thing is, is you and being helpful to, to you, and I really let you down. And I can imagine you're hurt and angry and pissed off, and I'm just so grateful you came back today and tell me what that was like for you. And he began crying, and we had the best session we'd ever had, and I just got the highest rating I'd ever gotten from a patient in the evaluation at the end of the, at the, end of the session. But that's critically important to write down uh, what, what, what you're telling yourself, and, and right away you'll see in your negative thoughts all, all of these uh, thinking errors. So a lot of this is in your book, uh, Feeling Great. It looks like this is certainly something that people really have to look forward to after after kind of a down year for a lot of people. But like you said, oh, yeah. it's the situations that were down. But, you know, I mean, you know, it's, uh, I guess you feel guilty. I actually felt a little bit of guilt saying, oh, well, you know, 220 was a rotten year, you know, type of thing. What's your thoughts about that as as we approach the new year now? Well, uh, I, I hope we will have a much better better year. There have been times in history where a lot of suffering has, has happened in World War One and the uh, pandemic of uh, 1918 and World War Two and all the other wars, and we've we've had our share of of uh, suffering and and, uh, and and tension too, and 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 sadly, uh, you know, some of these distortions lead to hatred. Uh, you know, you can overgeneralize with other people and say, oh well you're a Trump supporter, you're no good, or, or you're a lefty, you're a California lefty, uh, you, you know, you're a socialist, you, you're, you're no good. And, and we get to thinking about people in these uh, global ways, uh, and, and that can lead to, uh, to anger and hatred as, as, as well. And so the distortions that cause depression can, can also uh, cause, you know, violence and, uh, uh, you know, splitting of people in, in, into warring camps. And it's, it, it's really sad. And I'm hopeful that it, in the new year we can begin to move back to being, you know, a family of humans and uh, treating one another with, with greater, greater re respect. But I have to admit, I'm prone to these distortions, too, that can cause anger and, and hatred and seeing people as objects who are all bad blobs rather than, than, than human beings with strengths and weaknesses, just, just like, like me. And I'm, I'm hopeful that this, uh, this new year will be uh, one with, with much, much greater joy. And, and, 
and recovery on so many levels the medical level the, the, the you know the, the political level the 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 economic level level as well we all have fractals to work on i like that <laughs> yeah yeah that's right so uh, tell us a little bit about where people could get the book, Doc. We're running out of time for this session sure. here. Well, just, just quickly, you can just go to Amazon, and all of my books are available on, on Amazon.com. I think there's a discount still available uh, until the end of this month. Uh, if, if you go to my website, feelinggood.com, and go to the books page, you can click on Feeling Great and, and get a 15% uh, December discount on it at, at, at Amazon. But once you go to Amazon, all, all my books come up, Feeling Great, uh, Feeling Good, the Feeling Good Handbook, 10 Days of Self-Esteem, and and, and others as, as well. And, and the greatest gift you can give yourself or a loved one is the gift of happiness. And there's a high likelihood that if you give either my first book, Feeling Good, or my latest book, Feeling Great, to someone who's struggling with low self-esteem and anxiety and insecurity, those books can, can change the way that person feels. What was the spelling of the Greek philosopher? Because I teach medical history. Epi yeah, it's kind of Epicetes? Cool. Yeah, epic, E P I C uh -huh. uh, T E T U S, Epic or T I T U, Epic Titus or Epic Titus. You can find him on on the internet. I, just look look him up on uh, what's that thing where people get all their information? That Wikipedia. Wikipedia, I, 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 yeah, yeah. Greek, no. Well, that was interesting because yeah, I, I talk about ancient Greek, you know, medicine in my medical history class. Oh, but yeah. Uh, yeah, that's fascinating. Well, you love that. And Marcus Aurelius was one of his students. Uh, ah, Aurelius. very interesting. Yeah, he very much so. wrote a self-help so. book that wasn't very popular, and he wrote it 2,000 years ago, the first self-help yes. book. And 10 years ago, it actually catapulted to the top of the number one bestseller in England. It was published in England. It went to the top of the bestseller list. Wow. Well, Dr. Burns, it's a pleasure and such a joy to have you on here. I look forward to uh, having you on my other program in, in – uh, Connecticut, so I'll I'll have my producers reach out and and have Thanks. you come on again because we we we're looking for good positive things in the next new year and beyond. So I appreciate Thanks. all your time. Well, I love working with you. It's been an honor to be on your show, and I look forward to uh, uh, edition number two from Connecticut. Okay. okay, thanks a lot. And that thanks. does it for another edition of the Natural Nurse and Doctor Z. Wishing you guys, hey, this is the last show of this year, so. Happy New Year, and stay healthy, folks. Bye-bye.